welcome to another episode of Crimes and Witch Demeanors. I'm your host, Joshua Spellman. On this podcast, we tell tales as they're traditionally told, and then dive into historical and archival records in order to separate fact from fiction. Today's episode is actually our first listener suggestion from Lucas, who alerted me to his haunted alma mater, Kenyon College. When he told me that his college was haunted, I was like, yo, okay, it's a haunted college. Every college is haunted. Woo. But I was shocked to find out just how haunted and how rich the real history of this college is. I am so sorry for doubting you, Lucas. I, I, I apologize. There's absolutely a reason why Kenyon College always makes it onto like the top of listicles touting America's most haunted colleges. Because it is. Located in Gambier, Ohio. Kenyon College was founded in 1824, which has given it ample time, 197 years to be exact, to collect its fair share of ghosts. This college, though it has a great reputation as an elite school, seems to have gone through its rough patches. A fraternity initiation gone wrong, a destructive dormitory fire, an elevator shaft incident, a car crash, and a diving accident are just some of the misfortunes to plague this university's past. In fact, one of these tragedies nearly destroyed its reputation, causing enrollment to plummet. And just as the college began to recover, another catastrophic event threatened its continuation once more. Today, we'll investigate all of these tales. But first, let me tell you the alleged story of Kenyon College's most infamous tragedy. That of poor Stewie Pearson. October's prickly night air licked the back of Stuart Pearson's neck, goose pimples emerging from his skin like the cloaked figures now surfacing from the shadows in the woods around him. If it were anyone else, they might be scared. But Stuart knew who they were, and they were the reason why he was there. He was pledging Delta Kappa Epsilon, and this was the beginning of his initiation. The hooded figures glided silently into the clearing, forming a circle around Stuart and the other pledges. They said nothing. They simply stood in the dark, heads bowed, moving at a glacial pace towards the pledges. One of the other boys made a shrill sound like a mouse. Stuart looked at each cloaked figure in turn, knowing that beneath one of the dark robes was his father. He strained his eyes to see through the murky haze of the night but he couldn't make out a single face through the inky shadows cast by the figure's large hoods. All he could see was the occasional puff of smoke as their warm breath met the cool autumn air. Suddenly, the figure stopped moving in unison, standing mere feet from the pledges, who were now shaking. Even Stuart could feel his body hum. He told himself it was because he was cold— and not because of the spindly fingers of dread now wrapping themselves around his soul. Without warning, the figures leapt toward the pledges, grabbing them, separating them from each other, and they chanted, Delta Kappa Epsilon! Delta Kappa Epsilon! as they threw burlap sacks over the heads of the frightened boys. The world began spinning around Stuart as he was swept into the air and carried off into the woods. What was going to happen? He knew he was safe. He knew it. This was all part of the process. But the grip of dread around him just grew tighter and tighter. He felt as if he might choke. The cloaked figures carried Stuart for what felt like hours, though it may have only been mere minutes. He was simultaneously alert and on the edge of sleep, which only heightened his sense of confusion. Stuart was disoriented and sleep-deprived, having waited up all night the day before, waiting for his father's train to come in. Eventually, Stuart heard the sound of moving water. The cocosing? It must be. But where were they going? He felt now that he was being carried at an incline. They were going uphill. The footsteps that were once soft on soil now became something more metallic. A bridge? Clarity pierced through his mental fog. The train tracks. They were on the trestle bridge. Abruptly, Stuart was falling. Was he thrown off the bridge? Wincing in pain, 
barely able to breathe through the burlap, his back ached. That was his answer. No, he wasn't hurled from the bridge. The fraternity brothers merely dropped him onto the train tracks. Mercifully, they removed the burlap hood as he took in large gasps of the chill October air, which burned his lungs. Bewildered, Stuart looked around him and tried to regain his bearings. The cloaked figures formed a tight circle around him now, staring, silent, unmoving. And without warning, they again chanted, Delta Kappa Epsilon, and pinned him down to the train tracks. The cloaked figures pulled ropes from beneath their billowing cloaks and began to bind his legs together. What are they doing? Are they insane? He thought. Then he felt a hand wrench his left arm and pin it down. Then his right. They began tying his hands to the tracks as he screamed. They just continued their knot work, one of them stuffing a handkerchief in Stuart's mouth. Stuart began to panic now. His face was flush. He imagined it being bright red and steaming in the cold autumn air. Sweat dripped down his brow and into his eyes, stinging. Or were those tears? Stuart felt the dread in his soul once more, panic filling every cell in his body. He couldn't breathe. He felt like he was dying. And then, Stuart felt a familiar hand on his shoulder. His father. His tense muscles eased, though he still screamed through the handkerchief. Don't worry, son, his father whispered. There's no train coming tonight. Calm down, you'll be safe. We'll return for you within the hour. His father stood up as the other figures pulled their final knots tight. They didn't seem to notice his father had tipped him off. But Stuart still screamed and thrashed in his bindings as the figures walked away. For show, as not to give away his father's betrayal. Once Stuart could no longer hear their footfalls, he relaxed. It's gonna be okay, he told himself. Now, even more exhausted than before this ordeal, he felt his consciousness slowly slipping. But he welcomed it. If anything, he could use this hour to nap before the fraternity came back to untie him. With his eyelids too heavy to keep open, Stuart closed them and began to dream. After some time in a deep sleep, Stuart felt himself being shaken awake. But as he opened his eyes, he didn't see his father. But instead, the bright light of an oncoming train. If it wasn't obvious to you, Poor Stuart Lathrop Pearson was struck by a train. It turns out that while a train wasn't supposed to be coming that night, an unscheduled eastbound train was headed to Mount Vernon for repairs. The conductor and crew didn't even know they hit anything, and so the train never stopped. They only noticed something was amiss once they arrived at Mount Vernon and found pieces of fabric and blood smeared across the train. Now, how much of this story was true? It's honestly very hard to say, and it will depend on who you ask. There was so much controversy involved in the investigation itself, and the journalistic integrity at the time, as we well know on this podcast, um, was questionable at best. So there are some things that we do know. When Stuart was struck, his watch stopped, and so it's safe to say he was struck at 9.41 p.m. When his fraternity brothers and perhaps his father among them found his body around 10 p.m., it was still warm. They hurriedly removed his body from the tracks before another train came. Stewart's mangled body was taken to the home of William Pierce, who was the college's president. And he's going to be a really shady figure (laughs) going forward. And here is where things become suspicious. Instead of calling William Scarborough, who was the Gambier coroner, President Pierce instead called a local physician to examine the body, which is just the first thing that he did that was just super shady. The next thing that undermined any hope of investigation into this incident wasn't President Pierce, but instead Stewart's father, Newbold Pearson, who arranged for a special train to transport his son's body home before the sun even rose the next day. And... Conveniently, President Pierce didn't tell the police about this train's departure until after the train had already left the station along with Stewart's corpse and any potential clues and evidence that may have given us clarity as to what happened that night. 
someone must have called Gwen Stefani because the newspapers at the time went absolutely bananas. Not only were the newspaper articles insane, some of the newspaper illustrations at the time were also extremely outlandish and sensational. I found one of these illustrations in the St. Joseph News Press Gazette, which was published November 7th, 1905, showing a young man tied to a train bridge or a trestle bridge in what looks to be like a crucifixion pose. And on top of his chest is a skull lantern. But that's only the tip of the iceberg of these types of illustrations. I couldn't find the other ones because they're not available online. But I did put that illustration up on the podcast Instagram, along with a bunch of other goodies from today's episode. So if you don't already follow, follow at Crimes and Witch Demeanors on Instagram for documents, newspaper images, and stuff from the podcast. So thankfully, in an article titled Death on the Tracks by Mark Ellis in the Kenyon College Alumni Bulletin, he describes another cartoon from the Los Angeles Sunday Times wherein a train is drawn ripping into a body with a decapitated head flying through the air. Which is just crazy in a newspaper in 1905. So maybe it's best that this publication isn't available for us to peruse online because Instagram would have taken that down if I had posted it. That kind of gives you an idea of how crazy things got. And of course, headlines became just as crazy, such as Stuart Pearson's head cut off and placed in a lunch basket. A lunch basket was a recurring theme in all of the newspaper articles that I did read, but nothing about his head being placed in it, just that it was found on the tracks near his body. A lot of the newspaper articles that I read focused on the contention between President Pierce and the coroner and detective investigating the case. The detective, who has the most amazing name of all time, Detective Grimm, amazing name, ugh, accompanied Coroner Scarborough, also a fantastic name, to view the body, and Detective Grimm had this to say after seeing the body. The wounds on the right wrist and left ankle of the young man certainly seem to have been made by cords or ropes encircling them while he was using all of his great strength in trying to free himself. Both the coroner and the detective made public claims about these ligature marks, claiming that Stewart was bound. And it wasn't helped by newspaper outlets who apparently had a witness, who was a young farmer, who claims he saw Stewart being led to the tracks by a rope around his neck, much like a dog, with his hands bound together. There's also claims that he was chloroformed and that his father was the one to actually tie him down to the tracks, though his father, I believe, was actually back at campus on the college waiting for him to return in what is known as the Kenyan bullseye. So naturally, President Pierce couldn't have any of this smearing the name of his precious college. While one day a headline might read, Facts point to a ghastly crime. Former law student led toward railroad track bound with rope. An article the next day would boldly claim, not tied to track. President of Kenyon College derides coroner's theory of Pearson's death. So the long and short of this is that we'll really never know what truly happened. The investigation is way too muddy to draw any substantial conclusions. Now, taking pledges out to remote areas and leaving them there for a time were a common initiation ritual for fraternities during that era. Whether Stewart was bound or not is definitely a point of debate. However, it's safe to say that theories involving chloroform, which were purported by papers, or that his own father tied into the tracks are most likely false. As I mentioned, his father was probably waiting in the Kenyan bullseye, which is, I I can only ascertain this one circular window in the college buildings, which I believe is Old Kenyan, where both this haunting of Stewart takes place, as well as another one. But allegedly, the Kenyan bullseye as the last place that he spoke to his father, having said to him, Good night, Pop. I'll see you after a while. And sadly, he didn't see him again. So yes, the Kenyan West Wing bullseye is where Pearson's spirit is most often glimpsed by students and college employees. But it also seems to be the epicenter of other tragic events. As recently as 2016, I found a newspaper article where a student fell out of the bullseye window, leading to metal bars being installed for safety. I believe the student survived. I can only hope. So many students who have lived in that room with the Kenyan bullseye tend to avoid staying there on the anniversary of the incident of Stuart Pearson. 
John Hepp, who was class of 04, was one of the students who decided to stay in the room that particular night. John went out for the evening, but when he came back, the bull's eye window was wide open. It's also a window that is notoriously difficult to open, so it couldn't have just been the wind. Another night, Hep was lying in bed with his girlfriend asleep beside him, and he felt an icy touch on the back of his neck. Thinking it was his girlfriend, he turned, but she was fast asleep. Alarmed, Hep jumped out of bed and turned on the light, which was when he noticed that the lock, presumably installed by maintenance, on a small door in his closet was unhinged. Hep got a flashlight and opened the small door, which revealed a crawl space, and inside this crawl space were countless signatures and engravings of former students on the walls. Pledge books, Delta Kappa Epsilon memorabilia, and other trinkets littered the floor. However, there was one signature that caught Hep's attention. The initials SLP, with the date of 1905. Students also claim to see Stuart's spirit near the train tracks and roaming the campus, but he does not wander Kenyon College alone. He is joined by a litany of other spirits, which we'll cover briefly, including first-hand encounters of students and faculty. Perhaps, next to Stuart, the most well-known group of ghosts at Kenyon College are those that perished in the 1949 dormitory fire. On February 26, 1949, after attending the sophomore dance, students began returning to their dormitories in Middle Kenyon with their dates. Some had stayed awake in Middle Canyon Parlor, burning a fire in one of the, quote, new fireplaces. The old fireplaces had long been covered up and would not be seen again until the following morning, when the building was reduced to nothing but ash. Stray sparks from one of the new fireplaces had somehow cut into one of the lost chimneys and fallen into an old flue. From the flue, these sparks found their way into a space that was between the first and second floors, and the sparks smoldered and gases and smoke built up before erupting in an explosion into the second and third floors around 4 a.m. Seven students perished in the fire. Meanwhile, two other students died from skull fractures and internal injuries after a futile attempt to save their lives after jumping from the building. The seven aforementioned students were not found for days after the accident, as the ashes and ruins were too hot to search through. Ernest Awaji, Edward Brout, Albert Lewis, Martin Mangle, Jack McDonald, Mark Peck, George Pincus, Stephen Shepard, and Colin Woodworth perished in the fire. The building was eventually reconstructed from scratch and was nearly identical to the original structure. Since the fire, numerous reports of ghostly apparitions and phantom sounds have been heard. People have heard poundings on their doors and cries of, Get out! Or one individual who heard a knocking on his door and someone screaming, Ed! Wake up! Fire! It turns out his room had once belonged to Edward Brout. Now this is my favorite sighting in regards to the ghosts of the fire. Someone had seen apparitions in the building, but something really strange about them. On the fourth floor where they spotted ghostly figures, but they were only visible from the knees up. And then when he went down to the third floor, all you could see were feet suspended in the air. Upon further investigation in the college archives, it was revealed that the new structure's floors had been built 18 inches higher than the original building, and it appears that the ghosts are trapped in the old floor plan. In fact, it's said that the ghosts' feet can sometimes be seen grazing students' heads on the third floor. Now, I did mention the University Archives, which actually has a folder in their collection dedicated to the hauntings of the college. College historian Thomas Stamp states that the college's, quote, haunted reputation is relatively a modern thing, and that, quote, the ghost stories are certainly fun and potentially scary, but most of the stories are questionable, end quote. Conversely, I would argue that the stories that are most well-known and documented are indeed rooted in absolute fact. I will, however, give it to Thomas Stamp that some of the ghost stories are purely legend, while some are real but have been embellished by the students over the years, as Kenyon's reputation for being haunted has become a major draw or deterrent for potential students. A Reddit user expressed concern in the R. Kenyon forum about the college's reputation for being haunted and wanted to ask current and past students if they believed it was or not. There's a bunch of answers, but here are some of my favorites. Yes. That's it. Very concise. Got it. 
And then my other favorite is, let me put it this way. I, like you, really don't believe in magic or the supernatural. That being said, if anywhere is haunted, Kenyon is. Another student states, A buddy of mine and I decided to stay in a dorm where a murder homicide occurred. The girlfriend apparently stabbed her boyfriend and tried to hide the body in an elevator shaft. After that, she took a plunge out of her seventh-story dorm window. And then this person goes on to talk about a ghostly encounter of a window on the seventh floor slamming. Now this story, at least this version, is largely almost completely fabricated. The real story, however, does involve an elevator, but that's about it. In 1979, a pair of friends were coming home to Caples, the dormitory, from a party late one night around 2.30 a.m. Now, one of the friends decided to take the stairs up to their room, while the other opted to take the elevator up to his girlfriend's room. The elevator ended up getting stuck between the 7th and 8th floors, and the student pried the doors open and attempted to jump to the floor below. Unfortunately, he missed, and he fell down the elevator shaft. His body was found by a security guard the next morning, and he was pronounced brain dead on the scene. He later died of his injuries in the hospital. Now, I do know the student's name, and I do know a lot more details, but since this is still relatively recent, I I just want to respect the family and their privacy, and I'm not going to talk about names and whatnot. That's why on this podcast, it's very history-based because true crime and whatever from like modern current era or within like the last 60 years, it bothers me because a lot of these people still have family that are alive and this is a very real experience for them. So just keep that in mind. It's not my place. Anyways, I digress. Back to the ghosts. Many women in Caples experience waking up in the night with someone on top of their chest or the feeling that someone's sitting on their beds. Not very exciting. Pretty par for the ghost. Pretty par for the ghost. Wow, that's a... Put that on a t-shirt. However, the best story about Caples Ghost is recounted in Wendy McLeod's article, The Haunted Kenyan Tour in the Kenyan College Alumni Bulletin. In the summer of 1995, after all the students had gone home for the summer, there was one very eventful night in Caples. Safety officer Dan Turner was working this night, and he was told he should keep an eye on Caples in particular, because lately showers and lights had been found on while there was no one in the building. So it could have been a squatter, it could have been things, someone might have been staying there illegally. Around 5am, Dan got a call from dispatch over his radio, All units to Caples! The switchboard operator had received three calls in succession from rooms 511, 611, and 711, respectively. Each phone call was the same, the sound of a woman screaming into the receiver and hanging up. The switchboard operator said these noises were decidedly human and it wasn't a fax machine or a modem or anything of the sort. It was definitely a human woman screaming. So Dan Turner was the first to arrive at Caples, and he waited for the others to arrive. He positioned himself so that he could keep an eye on both entrances so that he could see anyone exiting or entering the building. Once the other officers arrived, one of them stayed in the lobby while the remaining ones searched every room in the building for an intruder. And after they checked a room, made sure that it was empty, they would lock it behind them so no one could re-enter the room. In fact, they were so thorough in their search, they even checked the trap door that led to the roof and made sure that it was properly padlocked. And after searching, there was nobody in the building. They had found a shower that was running on the fifth floor, and it was so hot that steam was wafting out into the hall. The officers searched the three rooms where the calls had originated, and they found the lights were on in each of those rooms, and the phones were unplugged. So the officers plugged the phones back in, turned the lights off, locked the doors behind them, and prepared to leave the building. But before they could begin to leave, the switchboard operator received another call, just like the ones before, scream and all, from room 811, which the officers had already checked, turned the lights off, and locked behind them. So one of the officers rushed over to room 811, and the light was turned on, but the door was still locked. Convinced that there was someone in the room, he unlocked the door and found nothing. But the phone in this room was also unplugged. Before the officer could even voice his confusion over the radio, he heard the elevator begin descending. 
the elevator in the building stays on the last floor it visited and will only move if it's called to another floor. So the officer asked the others if they had called for the elevator. Negative. So who was going down? All the officers began racing down the stairs to catch the perpetrator. When they reached the ground floor, they found that the officer who was supposed to be in the lobby was standing outside with his face pressed against the glass. He told the others he was outside because he wasn't going to wait for the elevator door to open by himself. But no one had come out of the elevator and no evidence of a person being there was found that night. The incident was officially listed as, quote, an unexplained event in records. Now, this story is still rather modern, so it's interesting that so many legends and misconceptions surround it. I did find a copy of the college newspaper from the time of the incident, and it goes over the mystery surrounding the events of that night. This article tries to explain in very minute, minuscule details all the possible ways that the accident could have happened, complete with diagrams of how the elevator was stuck and the boy's possible rationale for doing what he did, because none of it really makes any sense. Like, why did he try and drop to the seventh floor when the eighth floor was easily and safely accessible above him? Why did no one hear him scream? Was he unconscious by the time he fell? Why was his coat stuck in the doors of the elevator? None of it makes sense, but long story short, it's a mystery. All I can say for certain through my research into this accident was that the murder-suicide theory by the Reddit poster is completely debunked. That's just a total fabrication. So some people do suspect that there was foul play involved, others think it was a prank gone wrong, and others just believe it was a tragic accident. And you would think, oh wow, you're done with the ghosts, right? No, no, there's, there's more ghosts, but I'm running out of time, so we're going to do a lightning round kind of. There's nothing that I do that's actually a lightning round. Well, not this joke. Okay. Anyways, there's a ghost in Schaefer Dance Studio, which was once Schaefer Pool, and it was known as the greenhouse because it has this glass roof. So versions of this particular story vary, but essentially the gist of it is an Air Force cadet during World War II died in a diving accident, which led to the removal of the diving board. Some accounts say that he bounced too high off the diving board, broke through the literal glass ceiling, broke his neck, and drowned. Other versions leave him decapitated by the glass of the roof, and either way, man, dead, diving board gone. That's the gist of the story. Sightings include ghostly wet footprints leading to the locker rooms, despite there not being a pool in the building for decades. Schaefer Dance Studio is known as the creepiest place on campus to safety officers and maintenance workers, so I guess it just has this air of creep about it. So, the truth of the story. So, Kenyon College during World War II did host cadets enrolled in the Air Force Meteorology Program, but there are no records of any of them dying. The three-tier diving board was removed in the 1950s, but not because of an isolated diving accident or death or murder— No, it was removed because the new coach discovered that the pool was only 9 feet deep in the deep end instead of the required 12 feet. And in addition to that, there was a dangerous ledge between the deep and shallow ends of the pool where kids would come up from a dive covered in blood from crashing into it. So it was removed for safety reasons, not because of other safety reasons that led to a person dying. So rational explanation for the removal of the diving board. So, the next paranormal place, the Gates of Hell, which are two pillars that if you walk between them at midnight as the church bells chime, you'll be transported straight to hell. Do I even need to debunk this? Well, I mean, Ohio is probably as close as you can get to hell on earth aside from, like, Florida. So, maybe there is some truth to this story, but the spoiler, the twist, is that you're already in hell. It's Ohio. Sorry to all my Ohio and Florida listeners. I have opinions. And lastly, yes, this is this is the last one. We have Hill Theater, which is apparently haunted by car crash victims from an accident that took place on the site in 1937 before the theater was ever built. However, um, old maps say that there was never even a road in that particular spot. However, it could have been an unmarked road, it could have been a dirt road, but ugh, it's a little, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's suspect. 
But that doesn't stop weird things from happening. I feel like theaters just in general are haunted. Every single one you ask a thespian, it's haunted. So weird things do happen in Hill Theater. Most notably the ghost light, which if you don't know, these are like lights placed on stages and theaters at night to repel ghosts or help ghosts see. It's not really clear why people do it. They just have it there. I think it's also to stop people from like falling off the stage if they're like a guard or if they're there at night. But the term ghost light, no one really knows, like, is it to keep away ghosts? Is it for the ghosts so they can do their crossword puzzles? We don't know. So anyways, this ghost light on the stage of Hill Theater, inexplicably, the light bulb will become unscrewed as night watchmen are making their rounds. Or when they're in the theater, they'll see a hand or a figure pass over the light. But there's no one there. Ooh, spooky. And that is the close of our final act. Those are the ghosts of Ohio's Canyon College. So thank you again to Lucas for suggesting your very haunted college. It was it was a treat. I feel it was a treat. There was actually some really good stories hiding in these walls. As always, you can view historic images of the different stories, as well as documents mentioned in the episode on our Instagram page. Please leave us a review on iTunes if that's where you like to listen. And just a huge thank you for listening and letting me back into your life and letting me tell you ghost stories. So next week, we are going to be going to Georgia and it's going to be Mother's Day coming up. So one of the ghosts is a little motherly. Well, she's not motherly. She's dead is what she is. But one of them is a mother. Anyways, please do not join a fraternity for the love of God. And always take the stairs. Don't take the elevator. We know how that ends. We've all seen Final Destination. It's it's not good. And of course, as always, stay spooky. Bye. (laughs) 